190-year prophecy which was established uh, of things to come for Israel until the coming of the Messiah. And that would include the first 483 years which would pass until the coming of the Lord Jesus and then him being cut off. Uh, Daniel chapter 9 went on to include a gap uh, before the final seven years of that period would be fulfilled, uh, which we know as the tribulation period. We had a look at that as you look through the, the large part of the book of Revelation deals with the time of the tribulation. From Christ's resurrection until he comes to take believers back, we call that the church age. That's the age of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, God's ministering. That's, that's in the time here and now. But in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19, we read that John was to write of the things that he saw, Christ the judge, the things that are, the church age, and then the things which shall be hereafter. They, of course, begin with the uh, catching away of the church, in the, in the rapture, the coming tribulation, which again covers most of the book of Revelation, until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that in Revelation 19 as he returns in power and judgment. Not now as a meek lamb, but now as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Not now as the suffering saviour, but now as the crowned king. He comes to bring judgment on the earth at the climax of the tribulation. And then we enter the kingdom age, the millennial kingdom, in which Christ rules and reigns for a thousand years on the earth. We, who have returned with him uh, at the second coming, will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. God will honour his word to Israel, they will enjoy their nation and uh, the seed in their land with the blessing of their, uh, their coming Messiah ruling over them for a thousand years. Of course, after the thousand years, the devil who was uh, chained will be freed for a short period. There'll be a short rebellion and of course, the Lord will... Uh, we'll deal with that as he casts the devil into the lake of fire. And then we have the great white throne judgment in which the unsaved of all time stand before the Lord Jesus and uh, have their final day in court, as it were, their final judgment. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Last time we had a look at prophecy, we looked at the millennial kingdom and its climax at that point. What we want to do tonight is move from that point forwards as we step into eternity. But what we want to do is we understand prophecy that concerns the eternal kingdom. We want to make sure that we keep eternity with all the blessings of eternity and the millennial kingdom distinct. We noticed as we looked at the millennial kingdom that there are two categories of people on the earth during that time. There are those who have lived through the tribulation period, survived that, been saved through the tribulation, and they live on into the millennial kingdom. Largely, Israel will be saved through that time. Those who have not uh, lost their lives will live on into the kingdom. Uh, they will be anticipating and enjoying Christ, their King, their Messiah. Uh, with them will be many of the nations of the world that, uh, that also embrace Christ, that support Him, and they will live on into the Millennial Kingdom. Uh, they will be mortal as we are today. They will be living their human lives in this degree. Uh, but with them will be another class of people. They are the ones caught up uh, in the clouds uh, at the rapture, who uh, come again with Christ to rule and reign with Him, there will be those who are now immortal, still human, 
but in our immortal bodies. We remember that this mortal must put on immortality. That this corruptible must put on incorruption. And so during the millennial kingdom, there will be both mortal and immortal living here on the earth and uh, serving God together and working through that period. What happens as we get past the great white throne judgment, God's judgment of all the lost, they are condemned and uh, we step into the eternal realm. Well, let's have a look in Revelation chapter 21. Uh, most all of what the Bible has concerning the eternal kingdom is given us in Revelation chapter 21 and the first half of chapter 22. Uh, all that God tells us about heaven primarily is given in these little, little bit of uh, the scriptures. Uh, there's, there's not a huge amount that God gives us as he draws back the curtains and just gives us a glimpse of eternity. But it starts like this. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. We'll read through some of the rest as we continue on through the evening but for now why don't we go to the Lord in prayer we're thankful as we anticipate the return of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, for his own we know in time he will come in power and great glory and rule on the earth and Lord ultimately we look to the day when we'll be with you in eternity a new heaven a new earth new blessings Lord, we look forward to that day. We pray that you'd give us good understanding of these truths. And Lord, that you'd be glorified in us tonight as we learn in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I want to take you through four or five main themes that are given us through this passage as we consider. Uh, verse number five, if you'd look with me, he's, he that sat upon the throne said, Behold... I make all things new. I want to look first of all at his purpose. His purpose. All things new. He starts by dealing with the old. We see here the old earth as it is burned up. I want you to notice this picture uh, as he says there in verse number 5, Behold, I make all things new. Do you know this, uh, this artwork was actually done by those who support global warming. Uh, this was actually their concept of global warming. We're ruining our world. We need to fix it up. Actually, God says it's going to come to the end of it and God's going to actually destroy it so that he can renew it properly. And uh, he's going to give us the world that he intended for it to be. You know, we have a world today so corrupted by sin and all the challenges that come with it but God's intent for us is to make all things new. Scripture speaks of the new and living way which we have in Christ Jesus. We're going to see it begin to come into its reality as it hits real terms with the new heaven and the new earth. I want you to notice with them comes a new Jerusalem. In verse number uh, two, we see, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So what we see in the new earth, this new kingdom of God, the new presentation of uh, things as they're going to be, the old earth is, uh, is burned up by fire, renewed by God, not literally burned to, to ashes and gone, but uh, consumed to be renewed. And uh, so we have the renewed earth by God. And then coming down from God out of heaven is the new Jerusalem. God 
puts it here that she is prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Uh, the concept is as good as it could be. Here it is presented for us. We see uh, the um, scriptures uh, reference there to Isaiah 61 and verse number 10 as we read there as a, um, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. The same uh, reference made and there that holy city coming down from God out of heaven. You remember the words of our Lord Jesus in John chapter 14. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's, that's the city that our Lord is preparing for us. And here God brings that down, as it were, the gateway to heaven brought down to earth, that we might enjoy the blessedness of uh, God in his eternal presence. Behold, I make all things new. Let's have a brief look at the city itself, shall we? Uh, we start with the fact there uh, that it has 12 gates. In verse number 12, uh, we read there, it, it had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the, king, uh, the children of Israel. Again, we see uh, further on uh, in verse number 21 that those 12 gates are made of 12 pearls individually. Um, you would love to see the oyster that the pearls came out of. Uh, God, had, uh, God had 12 pearls formed and uh, he is giving us the best of the best. This is, this is the bride adorned for her uh, husband as it were and uh, we have... A gate at the gate, there's uh, an angel, uh, as it were, uh, the, um, uh, the introduction to the blessedness of God given there. And uh, on the, the gates, there are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. I want you to notice there the emphasis on Israel in their presence in the new Jerusalem. Because we go on to verse number 14 and we find that uh, we also have the foundation stones given. And there in verse number 14 we read, And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Now in verses 19 and 20 it tells us that those foundations were made of every uh, different uh, uh, amazing stone, uh, the precious stones that are given there. But in them are the names of the 12 apostles. And here we have the representation of the New Testament church. So the New Jerusalem, what I want you to understand here, is the dwelling place, not of the New Testament saint or of the Old Testament saints, but of the saints of all time. You see, we've stepped out of the time where God divides and differentiates in his workings between new and old. Here we have uh, old and new together. Uh, Ephesians 1 and verse 10 speaks of the dispensation of the fullness of times. that He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. So the old and the new brought together in one and so that we have the saved of all times living together for all time. What a blessed time that will be. If you're saved, this is your eternal dwelling place. We can look forward to that. Of course, the new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven. It is uh, stated that it's, uh, it's measured and uh, we won't use furlongs, but here it's... Uh, in the picture, at least it's in miles, it's about two and a half thousand kilometers square. Now, if you want to go for a drive, you can drive from Melbourne, you can go past Sydney, you can go past Brisbane, and uh, you'd be, what is that, halfway up to Rockhampton or something, um, uh, between Brisbane and Rocky up there, somewhere before you, you reach that. It is that square. That's, that's the larger... Uh, portion of a, a good square that you'll fit in Australia. Uh, this is going to be some city. This is going to be some city. 
and uh, we read that it is a city of pure gold. In fact, the gold of the city so pure that it is clear. Of course, the color of gold is the impurities that are found in it. The clearest gold, being the purest gold, is what heaven will radiate forwards for us. Of course, not only the streets which are gold, but the city itself will be, as it says in verse 18, of pure gold, the walls of jasper. His purpose? All things new. Can you see God dealing with all the issues of the past and establishing for the future a wonderful inheritance for his own? All things new. With that come a lot of different things. But I want to move from his purpose into his presence. His presence. The wonders of heaven are not the gold and the precious stones. It's not the blessedness of the place, but it is the blessedness of his presence. I want you to notice with us in chapter 21 and verse number 3, as we see there, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and shall be their God. God himself shall be with them. The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, it tells us in chapter 22 and verse number 3. God present with his people. Isn't that the eternal plan that God had? Isn't that what God uh, enjoyed as God walked with Adam in the Garden of Eden? Isn't that what man lost when, when Adam sinned? Isn't that what God brought about to some degree in the uh, establishment of the tabernacle and later the temple where God could dwell with his people. This is God's desire is that men could share the very presence of God with him. It's interesting as you look back, I think it's in chapter 19, uh, you'll find, uh, sorry, in chapter 11, Revelation 11 and verse 19, you read that the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. They looked up and they saw the ark of the covenant in heaven. Yes, the Lord Jesus presented his blood before the holy of holies in heaven and fulfilled his priestly endeavor as he made sufficient sacrifice for our sins. But at this time... Scripture goes on and it tells us in verse number 22 that there is no temple in heaven. In eternity, the temple even in heaven is unnecessary because we have God with us. Emmanuel in its truest sense is fulfilling his eternal agenda and uh, the tabernacle of God is with men. We see there uh, the uh, no temple therein for the Lord God uh, and the Lamb are the temple of it. The Lord Jesus Christ is there present. We don't need to ha find a temple to worship him. He's there before us and we can enjoy his presence there in heaven. It's interesting. We go on and we find that in heaven... There is no sun. Verse number 23 says there is no sun there. Of course, we don't need the light of the sun for the Lamb is the light of it, we're told there. The Lord Jesus Christ is light. It's interesting when God created the earth, He first of all said, let there be light and there was light. And we know that at that point, He still hadn't created the sun. God didn't need the light of the sun to bring forth light. God is light. And here we will see that in its fullest, uh, in, uh, fullest representation as we see God in His presence. His purpose? He'll make all things new. His presence? God dwelling with man. Heaven's Shaping up to be some place, isn't it? We want to uh, 
uh, want to check this place out. But we go beyond that and we notice his purity. I want you to notice as we go into verse number, and I haven't got a verse number here. Um, it's in chapter 1 and verse 25. Let's go back to verse 24. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. It's like they can walk from the rest of the world and just progress right through into the new Jerusalem. You're not going to have wings, sorry. You're not going to need wings. But... Uh, and you're not going to be an angel. Let's put, put that out there. We might come back to that. But verse number 25 of chapter 21, And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Well, you go into the cities uh, of old, and they would shut the city gates at night for security. Of course, we have security established there. Uh, when they built this gate in Jerusalem, they proceeded to close it in so that nobody might ever enter until the Lord Jesus Christ enters this gate here. But the gates of heaven will be open. I want you to notice something the Lord Jesus said. Pardon me. <clears throat> um, in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The Lord Jesus Christ, himself the gate, has made a way that we might enter in. There's no need for that to be closed in heaven. The gate is open. Jesus is the way. I want you to notice then as we consider uh, this eternal destiny, uh, this uh, new Jerusalem, that it is a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Here we emphasize that He is the way. With that, we also get the uh, concept uh, in verse number 27 that uh, it is a place preserved from, uh, from ungodliness. Verse 27, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. No, there's not going to be anybody who comes in who is not saved. Are you going to be there? If you're saved, you can be there. If you're not saved, this is not for you. We already looked at where the unsaved will end up. So there's nothing in, in this place which defiles. There's nothing which is ungodly or unjust, uh, nothing which is offensive to God. Some might say, but I went to church. No, that that's, doesn't cut it. Only the saved of earth will be there. But what a place where there is no sin, there is no ungodliness, there is no unrighteousness that surrounds us. What a blessed place that will be. Oh, some have their different uh, options of how they think they're going to get to heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ here will be verified as the way. And all whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will enter therein. We go on as we get into chapter 22 and we notice his promise. What's, what's going to be found in this place uh, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Here we have the uh, eternal city as it stands and the, uh, the river of water of life that flows forward out of it. What a wonderful concept that is. I want you to think of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ as he said in John chapter 4, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus is the source of the water of life. 
And out of his throne flows forth the very uh, provision of life that he gives, the water of life that flows from him. It's available for us today if we would drink. But at that time, as a physical water, it will flow through the city uh, and out from the throne of God. The river of the water of life. Interestingly, on each side of the river and down the streets of the city will be found the tree of life. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is the tree of life. But we've seen the tree of life before, haven't we? Of course, the tree of life was there in the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? And uh, Adam and Eve, when they took of the other tree, the forbidden tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, when they sinned against God and were put out from God's presence, God sent an angel that would stand before the tree of life and guard it lest they ate of it. We see there in Genesis chapter 23, uh, ch chapter 3 rather, verses 22 to 24, the Lord God said, Behold, man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. God guarded the tree so that man may not eat of that tree of life. Well, people are looking for the, uh, the water of life and uh, the hope of eternity uh, in all their different senses. They're looking for trees that will produce life and give them all kinds of things. You know, when God gave the tree of life, those who ate of it would live forever. That's what he tells us here. Was God harsh or nasty to mankind in withholding the tree of life? Actually, we see in Genesis chapter 3, one of the great acts of mercy of God right from the beginning. As God brought judgment on mankind for his sin and the wages of sin proved to be indeed death. God preserved man from living in an eternal death. Adam being sinful and now separated from God didn't want to continue on to live forever. God said, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to let you die so that you may live. For if you ate the fruit of the tree of life and lived forever, you would live in a state of death forever, in a state of separation forever. So yes, the tree of life reminds us that God brought judgment on sin, that he embraced our death so that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. It's interesting that the tree has 12 fruits. You can choose in this one, it's bananas and probably mangoes, maybe oranges and I don't know what the red ones are, maybe some plums and different things in there. And uh, uh, there's a pineapple. That's an interesting concept. Pineapple hanging on a tree. I've heard of people trying to dig up. Anyway, we won't go there. Um, uh, some of you know where pineapples are found. And, uh, but God's promise is life. Whether it be the water of life or the tree of life, it's all about life. And we see that its leaves are given for the healing of the nations. God gets down to practical realities. He wants life to the fullest. But what's life in the world that we live but the continuation of the curse? So Revelation 22 and verse 3 confirms the most wonderful truth for us and there shall be no more curse. The curse completely lifted. Now we saw before that in the millennial kingdom, the 1,000 years, the lamb will lie down with the lion and the leopard and uh, they are all going to have just a wonderful time of fellowship together. Uh, and uh, I'm sure mankind will enjoy some blessedness with that. You're going to see in some religious pictures that that is the scope and hope of religion. What they can see is there. But God takes us beyond that to a place 
where not only the physical millennial kingdom is fulfilled, but the absolute blessedness, the removal of the curse. There's not a separation of those who will be on earth enjoying the blessing and some in heaven receiving greater blessing. This is the eternal kingdom that God has for all. There's not 144,000 that get to heaven. We've looked at that before. Uh, and others who are reserved to the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom uh, is temporary, the, uh, the millennial kingdom. And then we step into the eternal kingdom with eternal blessedness and the removal of the curse in its entirety. Scripture tells us that today all creation groans and we feel some of the burden of the curse with all of the sickness and sorrow and pain. And so chapter 21 and verse 4 reminds us of the fullness of what this place has. It tells us in chapter 21 and verse number 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. As God removes from us the pain and suffering, which is the result of sin, and all these things moved away, God will bring us to the fullness where we enjoy His promise of life. We remember as sin is dealt with in its fullest. Today, since when Jesus died, we can be saved from the penalty of sin. Everyone who trusts the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ can be saved from the penalty of sin. God is working in our lives day by day to save us from the power of sin, to enable us to overcome, to walk with Him, to enjoy victory in our lives. But at this day, in the presence of our Lord, we will be saved from the presence of sin. Salvation in its fullest degree, one of the wonders of the blessed state of the believer, saved from the penalty, power and the presence of sin. This is going to be some place. We notice his purpose was to make all things new. His presence, God dwelling with man. His purity, they'll enter in nothing that defiles, only those who are saved by the blood of Christ. His promise, life and life more abundantly. But I want to bring you to a final conclusion of the blessedness of this place. In chapter 22 and verse 4, if you would go there with me. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. They shall see his face. Yes, we've got to the fact of the way, the truth, and the life, the Lord Jesus Christ, all of those things. But they shall see his face. If there's one thing I'm looking forward to in our eternal destiny, it is to see the face of our God. Job had that endeavor as he said, And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. This is the hope of the believer. Not just the removal of pain and sorrow and suffering. Not the removal of tears. Not the removal of the curse. Not just the absence of the presence of sin as good as that's going to be. Certainly not the pearly gates or the, uh, the golden uh, walkways of heaven. But the very presence of God there in heaven. They shall see his face. I want you to turn back a chapter there if you would. To Revelation chapter 19, a couple of chapters. Are you going to be there? I hope you're going to be there. Scripture says in Revelation 19 and verse 10 in the second half, Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
You're interested in prophecy? You find it exciting. A lot of people do. A lot of people get lost in the intricacies and details of it. But if we miss the very central theme, the very heart of prophecy, it's a pointless endeavor, a pointless study. Because when it comes down to it, prophecy is all about one thing. It's about God. Prophecy is about you coming to God, enjoying God to the fullest in the way that God always envisioned, in the way that God planned, in the way that God prepared a way. Yes, so Jesus is the way. That's why there's an open gate. He is the truth, God with us, Emmanuel. He is the life, the water of life, the tree of life, and all of these things. I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 22 as we come to the conclusion of the book of Revelation in verse number 17 we read there and the spirit and the bride say come and let that him that heareth say come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely You know, it's like John steps back from the wonders of his future study, the revelation that is seen. And God says, all right, let's step back into reality of where you're at. You're back here. And now the spirit and the bride say, come. It is the purpose of the church of Jesus Christ to bring others to the Saviour while there is time. Jesus has just said, I come quickly. Three times he has stated that. So the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And the invitation is put forward to anybody who would see the wonder and blessedness of the water of life that flows out from the throne of God. As he puts this invitation Let him that is a thirst come. Anybody that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, understand that prophecy is about one thing. It's about you and God. It's about you knowing God. It's about a preparation for your eternal destiny. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. If there's anybody here tonight who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, who at this stage would be headed to an undesirable future of the judgment of God. The invitation goes to you. Receive Christ, be saved, and enjoy the wonders of a blessed security, blessed assurance that could be yours. They shall see his face. What a wonderful promise that is. If you know the Lord Jesus, if you rejoice in the blessedness of heaven, the anticipation for the new Jerusalem, our endeavor is singular, according to the scriptures, to look out for those who need to be saved and to declare to them the water of life flows freely for all who will partake. You who are thirsty, would you drink from the waters? The spirit and the bride say, come. I wonder, are we impacted by prophecy? Do we allow the realities of all these things do a little more than just give us itchy ears? The rapture, the second coming, the great white throne, the eternal blessedness. We can get wrapped up in studying them or we can allow these realities to move us to serve our God as we anticipate his coming. Jesus said, behold, 
I come quickly and my reward is with me. He's looking to us, his church, to serve him faithfully. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the blessed truths that you've opened before us as you've given us a little glimpse of the heavenly kingdom that you've established, the eternal blessedness of the saints. Lord, we rejoice in all of those things. The removal of death and pain and sorrow, the removal of sin and the curse. What a blessed place. We thank you that we'll be with you in person, that we'll see you face to face. Lord, we rejoice in all these things. Move us and use us that we might bring glory to your name, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.